Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tatiana Show. You're very lucky this week because you're getting not one but two Tatiana Shows for the price of zero because I'm not charging you for these episodes. Um, but yesterday we had Amir Taki on. That was kind of really interesting. Uh, we had Lynn Ulbricht on. And today on May 2nd, we have Tom Woods. And Tom and I have known each other for a while now. We've been involved in Liberty Movement. And I remember when I first got involved, everybody would say, oh, it's Tom Woods. And, and I was thinking, why is everybody so excited? Uh, but then when I heard him speak, I, I knew why. And uh, Tom is a great way of explaining all sorts of um, bits of information and uh, you know some of the questions that I had when I came from maybe a little bit more of a liberal position into a libertarian position uh, were helped to be clarified with uh, with Tom's stuff. So Tom, thank you very much for joining us on the Tatiana Show today and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Very glad to be here. Great. So how do you get your qualifications? How did you get to be um, so knowledgeable about so many different things? Well, sort of in spite of my formal education, I suppose you could say, even though on paper, you know, I've got a pretty good resume. I went to elite universities. I went to Harvard and Columbia. I got a PhD in history. But although I wouldn't say, I think it would be silly to say I didn't learn anything at all when I was there. I learned a lot of stuff when I was there. But but on the other hand, a lot of stuff I had to learn on my own or I had to ask people I trusted, what are some good books on these subjects? And the nice thing about being at one of these universities is that in those days when you had to get old fashioned books, they had all the books. And secondly, since no, almost nobody else on campus thought the way I did, those books were never checked out by anyone. So I could get the books I was interested in. They were always right there on the shelf. They hadn't been checked out in 50 years or whatever. Or I would go and you know, years later, I would go and take out a book and I would say, boy, this book hasn't been taken out for 15 years. And then I'd look and yeah, the last person who took it out 15 years ago was me. <laughs> so I mean, no, <laughs> no, no other interest. So uh, I, it was right there that I realized that even at these top universities, you, you can learn a lot of facts, you can learn names and dates, but they're going to leave out a lot, or they're going to leave out certain schools of thought, certain interpretations that are not approved, that are not establishment approved. And so that became sort of my shtick, that I would be the guy who would go out and retell the story of America without the establishment slant. So what do you think that establishment slant, where do you see that that being most prevalent? And and how is that coordinated? Do you think that it's because of uh, public schooling and sort of indoctrination through through public schooling? Or what do you think is the way that they kind of get everybody to agree to it? Is there, you know, two guys that are allowed to write the history books, everybody else to the back of the line? How does that work? Well, I think in practice what happens is that local school boards wind up approving the textbooks. And these school boards tend, in general, to be composed of people who think a certain way. So if I wrote a textbook, there's it's just there's no way it would get approved. So that is a, a barrier to the introduction of different ideas. So instead, we get the same kind of narrative, which is that everybody knows that it's stupid and backward to have, let's say, a decentralized government, you know, where you have localities and counties and states and they all have their different responsibilities and make decisions. We all know that's backward and stupid and that even forward looking is to have a centralized system where in Washington, people who are your betters, people who are experts, people who are qualified to make decisions for you are running the show and are in charge and, and you know, you peons should be grateful to be ruled over by us. And then uh, related to that is that we all know that a free market economy is probably kind of stupid too. Instead, it's better if we have experts who know what's better for you to be managing the economy. So there are, these sorts of stories get told over and over and over again. And uh, there might be one glimmer of truth here and there, and then they pervert it into a, you know, a, a tissue of falsehoods. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm there to set fire to that tissue of falsehoods. Let that tissue burn. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, you've you've actually also I I guess okay. So when you when you talk about absorbing information, right? I was thinking um, you've also learned a lot because of your show. How many episodes have you done so far? I mean, you essentially have built yourself a life where you can interview anybody you think that's interesting and ask them whatever you want. So I, I would think that that was even more valuable than uh, than the library classes. Yeah, this is crazy. It's over 900 episodes now of the Tom Woods Show. And I'm actually planning right now a big in-person, on-stage live event for the 1,000th episode. I'm going to fly some special guests in. 
we're just going to have a huge blowout occasion on that day. But yeah, it's for, of course, I exploit this situation. I think to myself, I'll read a book and I'll say, I wish I could ask this person the following few things. And then I think, wait a minute. I'm a podcast host. I can ask this person, but instead of bothering the person with some emails that might never get answered, I say, why, how would you like to appear on my show? And then the person gets on the show, and then I selfishly ask all the questions I want. So that is, uh, that's definitely a lot of fun. And what's interesting about it is that you get more yeses than you think you'll get when you invite people onto your show. My friend Scott Horton has a foreign policy show from a libertarian perspective, and he's had all kinds of top-level people on his show. I say, how did you get so-and-so on? And the answer is, I asked. And a lot of the time, people just say, yeah, sure. I mean, I want to, I will be glad to leverage your audience to get my message out, is the attitude a lot of people have. So I've gotten, I've been able to have everybody from Ralph Nader to Ron Paul on the show with the wrestler Kane added in for good measure along the way. And it's been, it's been a ton of fun. Did you ever have any surprises happen? What was the most shocking episode? Oh, gee, <laughs> that's, I, that's the kind of question I wish I had prepared for. Cause surely there was one, yeah, I would say probably the very beginning of my episode 897 with just a few days ago with Thad Russell. And I can't repeat Who's what it was. Thad that he Russell? Said. He's a oh, historian. This is a terrible story. You can't even tell us. No, he's a historian. I knew uh, uh, when we, we met each other briefly. We were both getting our PhDs at Columbia, but we didn't really know each other then. And at that time, we weren't really ready to know each other. Like he was more hardcore on the left, and I was more hardcore on the right. And we would have just not gotten along. But now we kind of realize that whole thing's just annoying. You know, that just doesn't shed a lot of light these days. And we've we've both evolved a bit in our thinking. So now we just really like each other. We haven't seen each other since. But he was talking about his brand new podcast, and he started talking about some of the guests. And it was it was you know it was like people in the you know people in prostitution and you know I, I'm I'm all for edgy guests, right? And you know, and I'm a little square. There's nothing wrong with being square, but I'm kind of square. And I thought, I wonder if he really gets where I'm coming from. But I think, yeah, I think he just wants to you know nudge me a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. You know, I, I could take it. He's but, trying you know, to I, shake it up a little. <laughs> no, I, I, all I can say is when you do 900 of anything, there are going to be a few turkeys. And <laughs> I just leave it to the listeners to take a wild guess at what those are. But what, what amazes me is that you could have somebody on your show who is giving you one-word answers. I mean, how could you possibly think I invited you on for one-word answers? How could you possibly think that's what I want? <laughs> And so th th these are people like I'm sweating bullets trying to get something out of these people. Then I got to just send them away and never speak to them again. <laughs> That's really funny. I, I've been doing this. I, I don't even know how many episodes we have. I should probably count them of the Tatiana show. And once in a while I do get folks. So you, it's a little bit like pulling teeth. And yeah. sometimes people just freeze up when they're talking to somebody yeah. on the radio or on camera. And, I have a friend, not a political friend or anything, but she is hilarious in person. And she did a reality show, just died, just was the worst one on the show. So I don't know. Sometimes people choke up. Well, you know, I'll say um, I had some unusual things happen. Let's say I had somebody on Carlos Morales, who used to be with Child Protective Services. And mm -hmm. now he's a whistler, whistleblower about them. He says, these, these people, they sound great. We think, well, who's against protecting children, right? But in reality, he says, they're, they're doing more harm than good. And, and, he, and I asked him just point blank, do you feel like you yourself, looking back on what you personally did, do you have any regrets? Do you feel like I wrecked that family or I did these terrible things? And, and he, he was very frank and open admitting things on the show. And, and I do get that from time to time where it's, uh, wow, I'm really grateful that somebody was willing to be that open. And then even I on, on the show a couple of times, sometimes I run episodes that are me being on other people's podcasts. And I think, you know, I do five episodes a week. Sometimes I'm lazy. I think, good, I'll just use that as one of my episodes. Great. And of course, you realize, Tatiana, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, Tatiana's show would make a good episode of the Tom Woods show one of these days. But anyway, I'll ask you, I'll ask you about that later. But I was talking to Isaac Morehouse. Do you know him with Praxis? No, I don't think so. Oh, you'd love this guy. Totally love this guy. He's got this this thing called Praxis. And the idea of it is that instead of putting kids through the university slash unemployment axis, Instead, mm -hmm. axis of evil. Instead, you give them an opportunity to, uh, to, to, you know, to work with, let's say, a startup company or to, to, to do apprentice, an apprenticeship, and really get hands-on experience. And then you get out of there, and they guarantee you a job 
uh, earning at least 40000 a year, and the average uh, offer that their graduates are getting is 55000 a year, and they're starting at age 19. And now they're going to wow. get three years of experience over their, over their peers. It's, it's an amazing thing. Anyway, Isaac had for a while the Isaac Morehouse podcast, and I went on there, and I just thought we'd talk about history and things I do and entrepreneurship to that. We ended up, I ended up like spilling my guts about all my insecurities in my life, you know, and, and, and that I, let's say that was a bit of a surprise that the conversation took that road. Cause I told him the story of how, when I was in junior high school, I was just miserable and I have kids who are junior high age now. And I know the, so now I know the angst that they're experiencing, but I just did not connect with these other kids on any level at all. Just, I just couldn't. You were the work. weirdo. I was the weirdo because I, and it was, it was because I cared about things. Like I wanted to avoid nuclear war, things, you know, trivial things like that. I was concerned about that. Ah, come on. <laughs> Why let's, not Ninja Turtles, Tom? Exactly. I don't let's, understand. Let's, let's, let's throw the football around, which by the way, I also did from time to time. Well, anyway, it was really bad. They made my life miserable. It was terrible. Now, by the time I got to high school, I started to kind of get out of that. Um, Partly because I really worked on my sense of humor. I thought, you know, if they just saw how funny I was, maybe people would want to like me. And sure enough, they did. They'd say, okay, he's a little dorky. He's the captain of the math team. But he's so he's so doggone funny. I can't not hang around with him. Well, anyway, though, all the way up till I was in my early 40s. So we're talking about just a couple of years ago. From that moment all the way up to a couple of years ago, I would not let go of my hatred and resentment of those people. I mean, wow. it just, it tormented me constantly. I just, I, I just could not get over with what, what they had done to me. And so I would go through my life, every little victory I had, I would kind of think to myself, you know, that ought to, you know, stick in their craw. <laughs> you know, like I, I would be constantly thinking that, or I'd get a new car and I'd think, yeah, what kind of car are you driving? I mean, just awful, right? <laughs> really, really petty and childish and terrible. And it was just eating away at, my soul like spiritually that's not any good sure, way. Sure, it's not healthy for you so i even told the story of how i went to my 25 year reunion two years ago and and i walked through those doors and of course i had a lot of friends from you know high school was better but some of the tormentors were there and i actually went right up to them and started up conversations and it, and it turned out you know some of these were okay people and in fact one of them his child had had cancer and they had battled it in the hospital for like a year and it was just awful. And I thought, if that happened to one of my girls, I don't think I'd make it. It would just absolutely kill me. So the first thing I did, I walked right by all my f ordinary friends. I went right up to this guy and I said, I heard about what happened to your daughter. And that's just terrible. Uh, nobody should have to go through that. And this just opened doors just on a human level that I did that and I approached him. And by the end of the night, it was like, you know, we'll let bygones be bygones. Everything is all cleared up and everything's straightened up. And they were all saying nice, they, 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 they're all saying things like, we heard you're doing really well and that's just great. You know, we're really proud you're doing so well. And I thought, I have finally closed that door. I've closed that chapter in my life. So yeah, that that came out on my podcast was a little surprising. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what, those things, I mean, you know, there's the bully police, right? And there's something to be said for toughening up kids and not giving everybody the participation trophy because it's kind of silly and it, it's right. not not necessarily good either. But but yeah, I think kids can be really cruel. I remember when, when I was in uh, elementary school and middle school, I was pretty dorky. I remember these girls, they were throwing Jolly Ranchers at my hair. But then high school, for some weird reason, I became, you know, not a dork. And I looked exactly the same. There was nothing different. But it was hard, I think. You know, everybody wants to be accepted. And I'm sure it's difficult seeing children going through that. Um, do you homeschool your kids or no? You send them off to, to be tortured? Well, well for, for a while, we sent them to a really excellent private school. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean... I know this is going to sound weird when I put it this way, but this is a school that would invite me in to speak. Now, I don't mean that because I'm so awesome, that makes it great. I mean that I'm so weird, that makes it great, right? Compared yeah, to totally. what students would normally be hearing. Because they had this, in the high school level, they had this great ideas course. And when they would get to uh, 19th century classical liberalism or libertarianism, they would have me come in and teach it year after year. And man, I was getting away with murder in there. <laughs> in, fact, wow. in fact, I recorded my appearance in that classroom and I made that into an episode of my show. I think I called it something like what I told the 11th graders about liberty. So that was great. But then we moved, now we've moved to Florida and it's kind of slim pickings here. So it seems likely that uh, we are indeed going to wind up going the homeschooling route. I mean, my, my view is that if, 
as with anything, if you're in a situation where uh, you have a good, you know, if you have a really good school, then you might as well go ahead and use it. But uh, because in the same way, I don't do all my own plumbing or carpentry. I hire people for that. Same, the same thing with, with educating, but um, I think we'll probably wind up going that route. But my kids are naturally curious anyway. No matter what their setting is, they come home and they ask me a lot of questions. And I don't try to go out of my way to sit them down and say, now here's the lesson on inflation. And I don't do that. But if they ask me, then I give them my sincere answer. Or sometimes there'll be something on the news, on the radio or something, and I'll give them my commentary on it. And they, you know, they trust me. They, they like having me as their dad. And so when I tell them stuff, they're inclined to believe it. So now they feel like, Man, that federal government, what is it up to now, you know? <laughs> what a bunch of jerks they are, you know. <laughs> That's very funny. I like the yeah. picturing of that. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about um, just in general, people, uh, I grew up in New Jersey, and so we don't have a lot of homeschoolers that I know of necessarily. Um, and uh, for me, when I first heard about homeschooling, I thought, oh, these weird kids. But really, they seem very bright and I went to Berkeley in Boston, the music school, and when I came back, I started hiring interns at the recording studio. And these kids would come in with a four-year, uh, even Berkeley, great school, blah, 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 which is now $200,000 for four years yeah. of school, which Insane. is bananas. Insane. And if they had just gone to the studio, the first year and a half of working in a studio, you're cleaning toilets the whole time anyway. You would have saved two hundred grand. And yeah, I think that there's something to be said for um, for getting the degree. It does open doors because of the name, but if you can establish that name brand recognition, like it seems like they're doing with uh, with these various programs, then maybe that kind of gives it its own um, its own flavor. Do you would you use the Ron Paul has a as a book series right for homeschooling? Is that what you would use? Oh yeah, it's a uh, it's a video based curriculum from K through twelve. And wow. for for the high school grades, I created I personally created 400 videos on history from the ancient Hebrews all the way up to the present. And it was uh, but my my listeners would be tired of hearing me complaining about how much work it was. But let me tell you, <laughs> that, that took two yeah, years, here. and it was like nonstop work. So even when I was not so called working in my spare time, I was reading, reading because I wanted this to be the if I'm going to do this. And I have the possibility to reach a lot of young people. I want it to be the best I can possibly make it. I want this to be top notch. I want them to learn everything they can possibly learn. And it just really, really killed me. But yeah, I would like to use it because if you look, for example, at just the middle school science courses, they are so much more interesting than your boring, you know, let's let's plant some seeds in a cup of dirt and see what sprouts up. It is so much better. They've got uh, units where they teach the kids about robotics and they show them how to assemble little robotic devices that they can control or how to build a radio or how to be wow. self things like how to be self-sufficient in the outdoors. In other words, things that, yeah, you learn the science, but you learn the practical application, which is what kids care about. Why am I learning all these formulas? Well, the answer is here's why. Here's what you do with the formulas. That's really the that's the thing that I that I like about it. It's so it's not. I think what people think of when they hear Ron Paul curriculum, they think, oh, it's going to be libertarians teaching libertarian economics. And sure, you know, there's going to be some free market economics in it. But but what's great about it is all this other stuff. Like there'll be we have a course on personal finance for teens. Now, that's this is fantastic. something adults need to learn. Yeah. Right, yeah. so they won't be in debt. They'll make better decisions. It's just a lot of stuff that you wouldn't get otherwise. So I have my own page for it. It's ronpaulhomeschool.com. And on my page, if you get the curriculum, I throw in all these extra bonuses uh, because I'm that kind of guy. Um, you also have a Liberty Classroom, which uh, which I think is such a cool idea. I remember. Uh, not Liberty Classroom, but when I first got into uh, libertarian ideas and I became fan of Ron Paul, I watched The Money Masters, which is a pretty hefty video. It's, you know, three and a half hours or something, and it's not the best production value. But that alone, I thought, could replace an entire grade of social studies. I mean, I think just wipe out junior year, make me watch a three-hour movie, and that's way more useful maybe then two years of that. Um, what do you guys cover in Liberty Classroom and how extensive is that course? Yeah, I created that back in 2012 with a, with, because somebody gave me the idea. Here's how I, here's how I came up with the idea, how, how I quote unquote came up with the idea. And by which of course I mean somebody completely different came up with the idea. I just ran with it because it was so such a good one. 
Um, I, I, you know, for a while I used to be a, I used to be a professor. I used to work, uh, for, uh, for four years I was at the Mises Institute collecting a salary, but then after 2010, I have not collected a salary since then. I've been entirely on my own, generate my own income through various ways. And you got to figure out how to make a living online. I've become pretty good at that. Like I've become really really good at that so one thing that I've done is this thing create a product because I, I want to create something that I think will genuinely help other people and that they'll feel like yes take my money this is a fair transaction you, you put a lot of effort into this there's a lot of value there so Liberty Classroom came about when when a, a very wise marketing friend said to me Tom you you, you, you know you've built up a decent following because of your books and speeches and stuff so how are you parlaying that into some kind of online income and I said well I belong to the Amazon affiliate program. You know, that, that brings in like $20 a month. <laughs> He's just shaking his head like Woods. Do, do I need to spell it out? For, do I need to draw you a diagram? He said, think about what it is people are interested in that you do. And they're interested in when you tell, when, when you get up there and you say, here's the phony history and here's the real history. What if you actually had full-fledged courses where you went through systematically through history and you said, here's the real story. And you you bundle that into a product, and I thought, whoa, hey, whoa, hey, that's pretty good. So I brought on a few other people, like Liberty Movement people who had PhDs, and I know PhD doesn't necessarily mean you're smart, but in this case, it it did for those people. And I brought them on board. I said, let's do history and economics. And then later, I asked my people. I love my dorky subscribers. I asked them, what new course would you like us to do? And they said logic. And I thought, what is wrong? I with thought you? of that. I like oh, that. Too. I want to be able to fight people and destroy right. them with my logic. All right, that's good. That's good. Well, that means Tatiana, I and I mean this is a compliment. That means the old, <laughs> the old, the old dorky Tatiana is still in there, deep down, is still I'm in there. That's that awesome. deeply down. She's she's hanging. <laughs> she's, well, anyway, so yeah, so I hired somebody to do. I said, look, if that's what you people want, I'll give it to you. So at this point, we we're about to add our nineteenth course. So we just keep adding courses every single year. And you can, you don't have to, you know, it's not like we're teaching at 5.30 p.m. You just consume it anytime you want. That We recorded them all. And you can watch them. You can just listen to them as MP3s. You can use our our, our app, which we we just uh, released last year. Is and it then, for Android and Apple or, or is yes, it just? Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, for, for the iPhone people yeah. who barely know how to use computers. Got it. <laughs> oh, ouch, ouch. <laughs> no, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm an Android person, but it doesn't matter. So, yeah, so I did. But then also, we have these other benefits. Like uh, once a month, we do a live event where I bring the faculty on, and we take questions live. We got Q and A forums, all kinds of fun stuff like that. So, yeah, I created that it's at libertyclassroom.com. Um, I don't want to overwhelm people with uh, with with websites, but I actually give away a free course. So you can see, you know, if you don't like it, then that's okay. We can still be friends. But it's can you believe the domain? freehistorycourse.com was available. <laughs> I bought that. That's really I bought funny. that. It's the best 10 smackers I ever spent. freehistorycourse.com. It's our course on it's our course on the US presidents and so you can see all the crumminess all throughout history. Um so you were talking before about uh you know stories where it's the fake story and the real story and I'm assuming that not every uh, audience is initiated. Is there you know, some sort of a story that you tell that has the biggest impact that makes people who were full on government lovers all of a sudden really break through the, the, um, I don't want to say the brainwash, but through the brainwash. Yeah, no, no, sure, sure. Well, you know, it's, the answer is yes. And, and yet it's so different for so many people because for a lot of people, every, every person has a different stumbling block in a lot of cases. So for example, foreign policy is a stumbling block that I had. And then you start talking to them about how well it's all worked out. And they say, well, yeah, I mean, you gotta, gotta give them that. So with me, uh, as a, as a speaker, one of the things that I've noticed that people respond to is a story I tell about, uh, the chemical manufacturer, Herbert Dow. I mean, this story actually gets gasps from the audience, so you know you're onto something. And okay. the long and the short of it is I'm talking about monopoly, because we're all supposed to fear like the 19th century. The, the mm -hmm. idea you get from your textbook is that the economy was run by short men with white mustaches running around wearing a monocle and carrying mm -hmm. sacks of money with a dollar sign written on it. And, and I'm trying to say that actually it's, you know, real history is a little less cartoonish than that. 
So I gave the example of Herbert Dow, who was this great chemical magnate in the early 20th century, and he would produce chemicals like bromine that you would use for sometimes for film developing and in dyes and whatever. And there was a German cartel that sold these chemicals in Europe, and he wanted to break into the European market, and they made clear no upstart Americans or anybody else for that matter is allowed to sell here. Only we can sell here. And he thought, well, pff, there's no law that says that. I'm going to sell wherever I want to sell. So he wound up selling, underselling them consistently. And you're, so they're, you know, like they're selling it for 49 cents a pound. He's selling it for 36 cents. And so he literally gets a knock on his door. Like this isn't just figurative, like he got a letter in the mail. He literally gets a knock on his door saying, I would knock that off if I were you. Well, he keeps on doing it. So then they think, all right, here's what we'll do. We will really stick it to him. We will way undersell bromine in the U.S. and we'll just break him because he had to make profits in the U.S. to really make up for you know what he was doing. Well, anyway, lately the point, long and the short of the story is this. He ignores all the threats. He keeps lowering his prices, lowering his prices, and they respond by lowering prices of bromine in the U.S. So what he does is he buys their bromine in the U.S. because they're selling it lower than he can get it. So he starts buying it from them at their low price. <laughs> and then he takes that and resells it in Europe. And they, they're saying, how? So they finally say, well, all right, we'll sell it at 15 cents a pound. So they keep on doing this. <laughs> they, finally, they lower, they get it down to 10 and a half cents. They say, this will crush him. He's buying it from them. <laughs> and he goes over it. And so in other words, the old story is that what will happen is a monopolist will come by and he'll undersell all his competitors and, and then he'll be victorious. Well, this is what they exactly what they tried to do. But he figured if I just buy it at their price and I sell it in Europe, they can't sell it at, in Europe and the U.S. for 10 and a half cents. So they finally realized, all right, we have to make some cuts, a deal with this guy. So you tell that kind of story, you realize, ha, huh, you know what? If businessmen are clever when it comes to creating so-called monopoly situations, other businesses are equally clever at coming up with ways around it. So, it, you know, in other words, the economy is less cartoonish than we think. There are ways to, to get out from under this. Or, or we think of John D. Rockefeller, and he totally cornered the oil refinery market. But by the time the federal government got around to prosecuting him, his market share had gone down from like 85% to 25%, just naturally, because a bunch of other refiners popped up. So again, the idea that the government is the impartial bystander who will come along and rescue us, it just doesn't... A lot of times we wind up rescuing ourselves or the problem isn't really a problem after all, or the government makes it worse, or the government winds up uh, sanctioning the monopoly in the first place. So these sorts of ways of thinking get people open to new ideas, basically. When you have, uh, okay, so when I run into people that um, I'm trying to convince them that less government is more, and automatically everybody starts fighting about anarchy, and, and I'm not necessarily even advocating full-on anarchy. Um, but one of the concerns that I think is a little bit hard to combat is, uh, if you had, for example, the privatizing of the policing industry, right? So you had different options. How do you make sure that the rich people don't buy up all the good cops and then the people who don't have much money are just stuck with the dregs and they get attacked by the, the hard police forces that are bolstered by the, the financing of these rich people. Right now in this, this area, I'm not. I'm not much of a theorist of, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, in, in principle, I'm in favor, but I, I don't really give it much thought, but I mean, my, my instinct would be to say, how different is that from what we have now? I mean, the rich people have, uh, gated communities. They have, they have literal bars around their compounds. They have private guards. They have all the money, all the security money can buy. And what do the poor have? Well, a lot of times they're very unhappy with what they have. They, they, they're so unhappy that they're out protesting against their alleged um, protectors. Uh, half the time, the alleged protectors turn out to be abusers. Now, if that were what happened on the free market, we'd never hear the end of it. We'd say, ah, the free market, there it goes, oppressing the poor. But that is exactly what we have now. It's just like with education. Well, in a private system, the poor would have no options. Ex that's exactly what's happening now. Exactly. The poor have rotten options. Uh, in, in, and it costs a lot. Case they case. spend more on, they and, spend so much. And they spend a fortune. Meanwhile, the, the reality is when you look at um, the work done by James Tooley or by Pauline Dixon, they're at Newcastle University at, at a t think tank called the E.G. West Center. They actually have gone around, studied all around the world in developing countries. How are kids being educated? 
And by and large, more of them are being educated by private than by public schools. And you'd think, how in these developing countries can parents afford to pay tuition for a private school? The answer is, they're very low-cost private schools. And, and they, this is almost an unknown story until these researchers went out and found it. So most of these kids are being educated privately. They're being educated less expensively than in the government schools. And they get better results. Now, that nobody knows that. So that's how we're, we're always on the defensive because everybody just what, – what most people have in their minds is a cartoon or they, they have in their minds what their own limited imaginations can conjure up. They just think, well, if there's no real profit in, in catering to poor people, so therefore nobody will. And so they can't think beyond it, and therefore they just think, well, I've thought about it for 30 seconds. I can't see how it would work. Therefore, Forget it won't. It. <laughs> yeah. And so what I'm saying is, well, who am I supposed to believe? Your 30 seconds of analysis or my own eyes looking all over the world? Yeah. Wow. That's that's true. Um, what do you think of the uh, the the Betsy Davos lady that Trump put in? Is she yeah. still around? Did they kick her out? Yeah, I don't think so. She seems uh, she, to be doing OK. She, yeah, she's around now. She's. She's kind of not totally my kind of person because I I generally don't favor the school voucher approach because I st I feel like that's a uh, that's a wolf in sheep's clothing. How but do you mean? Because if if we want to help people be able to afford um, other forms of education, the best way to do that uh, to the extent possible is with uh, tax credits. Just give them their money back. But instead of but but this idea that we're going to give you this check of government money and you can spend it at an approved wink wink approved school. Well, gee, what are those going to look like? Exactly like the ones you're trying to run away from. Or would you be able to get away with teaching the things you want to teach if you have to constantly be looking over your shoulder at some bureaucrat who, by the way, has no moral authority over you given the rotten system they run, where you don't even feel physically safe where they are, you know their their schools half the time. And also, I feel like. Basically, what a, a lot of young and hardworking parents are working toward and what they're pouring their blood and sweat into is earning enough money so they can live in a decent neighborhood to send their kids to decent schools. So their kids won't have to be, frankly, in schools full of troublemakers, at schools uh, where the kids are going to terrorize them all day. And I, I know, of, I mean, I think of my own kids. I have sweet, naive kids, and they would be just ground up and spit out by those sorts of systems. So... Why would I favor a system that says, all right, at least I'm carving out some kind of consumer responsive system. At least I've, I have a system where I can go to a neighborhood and I can, uh, I can kind of pick that way and find at least some kind of school that I like. And, but, and, and, but then now say, well, look, everybody can get a voucher and come on into my school. No, no, no. I just fled from these people. You know, I fled from the dysfunctional neighborhoods that I worked my tail off to get out of. Maybe I grew up in those neighborhoods, and I said, my gosh, these neighborhoods are full of crazy people. I can't wait to get out of here. And then they follow me. So I, I, I'm not a big fan of that. But uh, there is a, a woman named, I think her name is Candace Jackson, and she is in the, she, I forget what her exact title is, in the Department of Education. She was appointed by this new secretary, and she is a hardcore Murray Rothbardian who studied at the Mises Institute. And when that was discovered, the media went absolutely berserk. And I thought, you know, if I get nothing else out of these four years, I can at least point to this woman. <laughs> um, so do you think, what do you think of this whole Trump thing? I think uh, obviously Hillary was the crowd um, unfavorite, you know, the, the bottom of the barrel is as bad as it could get. So um, that, that allowed Trump to come in. But I think a lot of people viewed him as all oh, racism or something. But I think that he, he indicated to me a rebel spirit in the United States that people right. were not voting pro Trump. They were voting anti government um, up your butt ism. Uh, what do you think has been the result? Cause I think it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. This tax plan supposedly looks good. Um, but the serious situation, not so much, uh, the saber rattling with North Korea. I mean, what's your take on this administration so far and how valid do you think the administration is? Cause when 2012, uh, when Ron Paul lost, I figured forget all these people <laughs> and I just gave right. up on politics altogether. Right. Um, so I know it's like a bunch of questions, but if you can maybe speak to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I followed Trump with some interest because I liked some of the things he had to say. And I liked the fact that he was, even though he would say crazy things from time to time, that was in a way part of his appeal because he was unrehearsed. I mean, think of Ron Paul. 
obviously he's not the same thing as Donald Trump, but he was unrehearsed when he would go into these debates. Now, I, maybe he could have, should have been a little bit more rehearsed, but the point <laughs> is, he, I mean, right. I mean, you might as well, you want to be at your best, but, but the thing is he was, he was sincere and spontaneous in his answers in the debates. Well, for Trump, it was quite clear he had not rehearsed those answers. If he had rehearsed those answers, then the people who gave them to him should have been fired. But, <laughs> but it was that he, it was refreshing that he didn't seem plastic. Whereas Ted Cruz had these, you know, he'd have these pauses that were just a little too long and, and annoying and they were obviously fake and he had obviously done them in front of the mirror 25 times. And, you know, and he, he got some support, but I think some people thought, you know, I think I've had enough of these slick, you know, uh, hair people with the rehearsed speeches and everything. So I was interested in that, especially because he went to South Carolina and said they lied to us about the Iraq war. And there are people who all they could do was say negative things about Trump. And I get his negatives, but come on. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was saying a lot of things that I couldn't even. He said fake news. That alone yeah. was awesome. That was awesome. That was, was great. I mean, and it, and him what? loving uh, what's his uh, Julian Assange. He was into him now. Right. Not as much, apparently. Not as much. But right, right, right. He should I mean, be. Any, anything that demystifies the, the national media, that has to be a part of the revolution, let's say. So if that's getting done, as long as it's getting done, Jeb Bush is destroyed forever. That was an accomplishment. I'll take that. But the problem is people voted for Trump and they got Jeb anyway. That's just it. I mean, okay, Jeb wouldn't have done a few of these things, but Jeb probably would have passed the same health care bill. He, okay, he wouldn't have handled North Korea exactly the same, but he'd be doing something in Syria. He'd be beefing up the American presence in different places the way Trump is. So the fact that John McCain and Lindsey Graham are cheering for Trump. I, I've been tweeting out, look, if they're cheering for you, that's a pretty good sign something's gone wrong, like you've gone off the rails. And then to be told that the reason he went into Syria was because he saw some sad pictures on television is not reassuring. And, and I don't mean to make light of the terrible deaths that these people no doubt endured, but that people are enduring terrible deaths constantly and at all times around the world. At the hand, I mean, think of how many people were beheaded in Saudi Arabia last year. It's a comparable number. And I bet that would make for pretty gut-wrenching television. So so I don't buy the whole, I saw a, a, a tear-jerking thing on television, therefore we have to go bomb. So very disappointing. And then to have him walk back so many of his statements. I mean, I don't care that he walks back some of them because they were wrong, but <laughs> for him to, to all of a sudden say, oh, no, 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 NATO has a great role to play, or... Um, terrible. Oh, but the, but then when you go back and look, you realize that even on the campaign trail, he was sometimes a little bit at odds with himself. Like he would say, on the one hand, the Federal Reserve is blowing up a financial bubble, and then on the other hand, he would say, I really support the low interest rate policy. But you see, the low interest rate policy is what blows up the bubble. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, you know, and then to have him say, I think Janet Yellen's doing a pretty good job. When on the campaign trail, he said he probably wouldn't reappoint her. It's like when you when you walk over that threshold into the White House, it's like zombies eat a part of your brain or something. I, it's weird. But do you think it's the deep state, or do you think that he was truly unprepared and overly arrogant um, in his – like, is he, is he crazy like a fox, or – or has he been compromised? I mean, is there anything genuine left in this campaign, or do you think it was yeah. BS? It's it's hard to know, and I, I'm not. I don't even think it's the case that he was uh, he was tricking people. I I think that I don't think he has a super well thought out, sophisticated philosophy or anything. And, and I think that now that he's under these tremendous pressures, I mean, I don't think there's been any president where the media has been so adversarial and so all these mean to him. They're yeah. terrible to him. Well, and these all these they're accusations about about Russian influence, mm -hmm. like they're terrified at the prospect that we might have some kind of rapprochement with the Russians. Like that's the worst thing we could. Well, they don't have to worry about that now because it. You know, that's kind of gone in the can, too. I mean, of all the things to criticize Trump for, as, as Scott Horton says, why would you pick out, like, one of his the best things about him, <laughs> which was that he wanted to try to thaw relations with Russia? You don't criticize him for that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I agree. I so, mean, that's no, okay. Good. No fighting. Right, exactly. Everybody chill out. So who's to know? I mean, who can really know what behind the scenes if he was told what's what or, or whatever, or if he just felt like, because I kind of feel like, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, when he resigned as Pope, which is almost unprecedented, I felt. Although there's a lot of speculation as to why that happened, but but one very plausible theory is that he was in his 80s and he came to the conclusion that 
I'm up against so many enemies. There's no, I can't accomplish any, anything, and there's no point in trying. And I'm old, and that's it. And it could be a similar thing. I mean, obviously Trump is more vigorous, but it could be a, a thing where he came to the conclusion that I literally cannot do anything at this point uh, because the enemies are so great. Even within my own party, they're so great. I cannot do anything. So I am just going to have to morph into a conventional Republican who from time to time does unorthodox things. Uh, that's I don't believe that this is, quote, 4D chess. This is just an embarrassing theory, I think, that uh, it, this is the sort of thing that's trotted out whenever people have a hero they can't let go of. They can't just say the hero made a mistake. It's always, oh, no, no he knows things you and I don't. And so he's got some real strategy. This he did this terrible thing because he's secretly hoping to. I think that's too clever by half. I, I don't see any reason to believe that. Yeah, I think that people uh, they love their heroes. I mean, I everybody worships Ron Paul, but um, you know, in retrospect, there are some things that could have been done differently. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, and that's a great example, Tatiana, because people would say during the Ron Paul campaign, there would be. I mean, obviously, you can love Ron as as I genuinely do. I mean. Who doesn't I, I, love Ron yeah. Paul? I mean, I he worked my tail off for that oh, cause, totally. you know? So I, I love that guy. But that doesn't mean you can't think that maybe a staffer made a bad decision. I mean, he, I mean, could, of all people, Ron Paul would be the last person who would say to us, you must never question what my subordinates do. Could you imagine? What is this, Joseph Stalin? He would never have done that. So, But there would be people during the campaign who, instead of saying, yeah, you know, the staff really – is making a strategic error. Instead, it was, oh, no, this is actually a brilliant move, and you, Woods, are too naive to understand the ways of the world and whatever. You know, go jump in a lake. I don't buy any of this. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's. Uh, I think the healthy criticism is good, and I'll say this. You know, I've never been you know, a huge Ann Coulter fan or anything. Um, I remember seeing her. I won uh, ISFLC and wine. the uh, it was awful, but she wrote a really great piece in Breitbart criticizing um, Trump saying, you know, we want the president back that we voted for. And it was nice to see the pushback from his hardcore yeah. base, um, you know, sort of the the kind of right wingers or whatever, their own faction. I don't want to label them alt right because I don't think it's a, no. a fair categorization for everybody. I think as a negative connotation, I don't think that everybody on the alt right is horrible. Um but in, in this case I was happy to see the pushback because um and now I wonder who's left, right? Because the anti war is supposed to I'm sorry, the anti war faction is supposedly the left, but they're super pro war. Look at CNN and their their little cohorts. Jeez, uh yeah. but the right is now pro war. So it's like what where did where did the peaceniks go? Um, yeah. And so that's why I've had I, I have friends who say if Hillary had been elected, you'd still have these anti-war right wing people. But now that it's a Republican, well, now they're gung ho for it. And the thing is, I think most of his hardcore voters are still with him because they most of them can't make they don't know that it's bad that a Paul Ryan of all people influenced a uh, health care bill is a bad idea. Like they just think Obamacare bad. So I, I think a lot of them are not going to see the depths of the problems until he really, really turns on them. But but in terms of like the thinkers at the top of the movement, it has been encouraging to see an Ann Coulter stand up and Nigel Farage in Britain stand up and say this is a big mistake and he shouldn't do it. Uh, two things I would say about that. First of all, um, this is certainly better than we saw among most Obama supporters because most of them – now there are certainly exceptions – uh, and they were very honorable. But by and large, when Obama would do something terrible on foreign policy, they would either ignore it, make excuses for it, hold their noses, whatever. You didn't see this kind of backlash against Obama that we see against Trump. So that is, you know, I don't know what that says, but it's something. But the other thing is, as long as we're talking about Ann Coulter, man, what a mistake she made backing out of speaking in Berkeley. She should have gone ahead and done it. R regardless of whether her sponsors were still behind her, she should have said, this is going to bring the crazies out like nothing ever before seen, and that will be good for the cause of civilization and sanity in this country, for people to see what these people are really about, who they are, what their intentions are, and what's coming to a neighborhood near you. She could have performed that service, and instead she backed down, and that was just a major mistake. Yeah, you know, I didn't really pay that much attention to the story, but as you explain the take on it, that does sound pretty wild. It, it's it's crazy how I don't know. I mean, I was I performed at this Deplora Ball down in DC, and I was very concerned because everybody says Milo's so terrible, 
And I don't know. I mean, I watch him. Eh, some things are kind of offensive. I, maybe because I'm from Jersey, we don't get so easily offended. Right. But the the rabid um, insanity of the protesters is so much more disturbing to me than anything that Milo could ever say or any of these people who I think are kind of just being ridiculous and funny in a way to or almost provocative on purpose to point out the hypocrisy. Um, but it's very disappointing. But how do people... How, you know, I, I have a song, the same side, right? I want us all to kind of join together with such animosity. Where Where is the sanity to be found? How do libertarians reach out to not only people on the right, but also to people on the left? Like, what is the what is the solution when the the Antifa people are going bananas and, and causing so many problems? Yeah, those people, I would say, there's no point in trying to reach out to them. But I mean, my, my view is you, you 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 ask yourself, what's my strength? Who are the people I can most easily identify with? Low-hanging fruit. Yeah, low-hanging fruit. So I think of my own background. Now, I, like a lot of people who listen to me, come from a more right-leaning background. But I have a lot of people, because I hear from them every day, who came from a more left-leaning background. And they say, um, you know, look, I had the same sort of experience you did just from the left. And I, I where I, I suddenly realized the things I had been taught to believe – we're just not something wasn't wasn't quite right about them, and and you know we all go through that moment of saying, aha, I now have to look at the world a different way. So I wouldn't say there's any one approach. Rather, just think about because I, there are some of us who were just born libertarian. I certainly was not. Uh, those people, I don't know what your assignment is. Go read a book or something. I don't know what your assignment is. But for all of those of us who converted from something else, go back and find some of those people you know that you that you knew when you were in those days and try and engage them and just uh, see you know try and see what works and find low hanging fruit issues because certainly you can agree that <clears throat> we should be cutting the budget a bit more and uh, we can agree on the following five things and then just ask how does it seem to be working out no matter which person we vote for uh, the the system seems to roll along pretty much unchanged. What does that tell you about the whole system? Maybe you should think differently. You know, see where that see where that takes you. Or, or if you just can't help yourself, you get behind a microphone and you start a podcast and you talk to people that way. And that's been working for me. I, I have so many people, people who say, oh, Woods, you're just preaching to the choir. But even if that were true, my choir is a really proselytizing choir. They bring my episodes to the great unwashed who then listen to them and say, hey, this is some pretty good stuff. So the choir carries the message to the other people, to the people who are loitering outside the church. And I've brought a lot of those people uh, in without even really trying, just, just saying what I believe and being sincere and being as informed as I can be. And believe it or not, that seems to work. Yeah, well, I know. I guess it just starts to feel a little bit overwhelming sometimes. Um, I had this guest on a uh, couple last week named Ryan Dawson, and he does a lot of foreign policy stuff, and he's really great with that. And what he was saying was, you know, instead of people fighting on Facebook is just do a phone bank and call your uh, representative or go down there and talk to them about your issues because there are people too, and they're getting bombarded by pro-war this, pro-war that, and, uh, and they're not hearing the opposing voice. And it was a simple exercise where you know, each of your friends, everybody calls it 15 minute slots, whatever. And it was such a simple thing. Um, it made me feel a little bit better about uh, how to approach this. If you had another tip besides podcasting, what would be the best way to kind of bring people into the fold and, and spread the message? Like, have you seen any techniques that are working or anything that you're kind of excited about in terms of activism that you think is, is effective? Well, what I like is that I'm seeing now people who do things other than just blogging and arguing on Facebook which I have done plenty of, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we need people blogging and we certainly need people on Facebook doing stuff. Don't just don't waste too much of your time because it's, you know, it's well, it's a purposeful echo chamber that's manipulated. That's the problem with Facebook. Right. But right. yes, right. Social media in general. But what I've seen is actually people just thinking, well, here's what I do, or here's, let's say a talent that I have and how can I turn it to the, to the good of this. And so I've seen now, uh, several stand-up comedians who I know for a fact are libertarians and they in their own way get the message out or um, you know the musicians like you for example you write great music but you also you know you, you get it to the man right. 
the little exactly. version. That's right. <laughs> and and, a, and another example of that is this. Uh, maybe you're familiar with this band, Backwards. They're a, a metal uh, rap band uh, mm -hmm. uh, headed up by Eric July. Yeah. Now, they they are about as blunt as you can possibly be. I mean, they have. Uh, you know, they have a, a song on individualism. They have a song on praxeology. I mean, this is a little bit technical. Uh, they have a, a a song called Utopias Don't Exist. If you look at their their album, it's very, very blunt. But they're going after a demographic that we are at risk of losing. Like we had that younger group when we had Ron Paul, and now we don't have Ron Paul. And for whatever merits Rand has, he hasn't connected with that young audience the way his father did. So... I mean, basically, the, the short answer is just look at what, what it is that you are knowledgeable about or can do, and then think, is there any way I can put this to the service of the things I believe in? And so that's what I see bearing a lot of the fruit these days. Um, yeah, and I think also fostering community. Um, one of the things that I really liked about going on the Contra Cruise last year was the sense of everybody sort of building up a relationship and almost getting that sense of family. And, and, you know, I've seen everybody carrying on those relationships, you know, through social media and stuff like that. Uh, this coming year, people are going to be going again. Can you tell us a little bit about Contra Cruise? Yeah. Bob Murphy, who's an economist you've spoken to on the show before. Bob. Have you not? Have yeah, Bob is a really good friend of mine. We've done okay. an Economics 101 episode, too, which was good, really fun. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, I know you guys have known each other for a while, and um, so, of course, you were a natural choice. We wanted to have you as a musician aboard the cruise. Bob and I actually host a weekly podcast on top of the daily one that I do, and it's called Contra Krugman, and we take one of Paul Krugman's two New York Times columns for the week, and we critique it. And we, we, we look for the errors and we overturn them. But more than that, we just have fun doing it. Like we're joking around. We're, we're taking jabs at each other. Um, and then we try and make really awkward segues into promoting the cruise on the, uh, on the episode. So uh, somebody will, you know, will say uh, something like, yeah, you know, he had to – so-and-so worked really hard on that. And then we'll say, you know where you won't have to work hard is aboard mm -hmm. the Contra Cruise. So right. we decided, well, you know, what the heck, if National Review, Bill Buckley's old magazine, if they can have, I think, two cruises a year, mm -hmm. we can have a cruise. Why can't we do that? Oh, yeah. I so, love a cruise idea. It was so fun. Yeah, so I went. I approached one of these cruise companies, and I said, "I think we can bring X number of people, and here's what we'd want to do." So yeah, we you know we have you know we give a couple of talks, but we had fun. I mean, we did Pictionary with libertarian topics, we did Family Feud with libertarian questions, and I had genuinely surveyed a hundred people, just like in the real show. Really, my, cool. my Twitter feed, I'd surveyed a hundred people. We we compiled the answers, and they were just it was so funny. People just had nonstop fun. We rotated tables at dinner every night, so people would get to sit with different people. People, sit with Bob, sit with me um, and each other. And it, yep. it just was nonstop fun. In fact, it was so great. Bob and I would have like a little meeting at the end of each day just to go over how it was going. And I remember one of those, we looked at each other and said, this is going so well. It's like better than any of the books we've ever written. Like this is the best thing we've ever done. <laughs> By a mile, this is the best thing we've ever done. So we are definitely doing a second one. Uh, you can find out about it at ContraCruise.com. What's funny, at, at ContraCruise.com, we have a four-minute video montage from the first cruise that we did. Have you had a chance to see that video? Because you're in it. Yes, yeah, no, definitely. It is a great, it really gives you a good, as, as well as four minutes can, a good sense of what it's going to be like. Notice how I say, I don't say what it would be like. What it's going to be like when you are on, when you are aboard the Contra Cruise with us later this year. It is, we, we're calling it the Libertarian Event of the Year. It's just fun. And we actually had people on that cruise who, who told us, I had actually not been aware of this, who said they had never met another Libertarian in person before in wow. their entire lives until they were on that cruise. I think you need to make a, a, an outreach to more singles, though. That was the only thing last year. It was yeah. all couples. You know, all right. And you know what was funny was that the women were dragging the men. It wasn't like, oh, what happened? Your husband brought you. Your <laughs> boyfriend brought you. They're like, nope, I brought him. There was this one lady. She was a good dancer. I liked her. Well, we were we were very pleasantly surprised about that aspect of things. That really there was no either male or female dragged spouse syndrome. They everybody really was very engaged. I agree. Everybody was really happy to be there. Do you have any other people coming besides you and Bob and me and uh, the for, band? I guess. For special guests, we are going to have uh, this year Scott Horton, who I've mentioned several times before, who is the libertarian authority on foreign policy. 
Yeah, We're going to have I, you. You must have met at some time or another Michael Bolden, the Tenth Amendment yes, Center. Yes, Michael's a Michael's a really fun person too. That's why I invited him. Not even yeah, yeah. Tenth Amendment. That's great. I invited yeah. him because he's so <laughs> fun to hang around with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. So yeah, so I hung out with Scott too. I think he was going to be at Pork Fest or one of these crazy events. So that'll be yeah. that'll so be that's a little be reunion. Fun. And then for for uh, musical uh, entertainment, we're 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 adding uh, Jordan Page into the mix. Yeah, that's going to be yeah. great. He and I yeah, hopefully we're we're trying to coordinate Pork Fest right now, getting the oh, band yeah. back together. So oh, that's going to be great. Well, I'll tell you when when the first cruise went on, he contacted me and I said, you know, let's wait and see how if this one is a bust or, or is successful or not. Because I mean, he's leaving six kids when he comes, and I, I oh yeah, I, it's I, a I, lot. Needed, I needed to make sure this was going to be a going concern first, and then when it was a success, I called him up and said, okay, why do you think I'm calling? <laughs> yeah, just invite him on this thing. Cool. Yes. Well, I'll be, I'll be happy to have him there and, uh, and yeah, it's going to be fun. So, um, is it affordable for people? How do, how do people do it? Can they go forward to a room and make it a little cheaper? Cause cruises can be a little expensive. Yeah, they are. I mean, of course, um, obviously if you bring somebody and you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, cause there's a premium that's paid if you get your own room, but mm -hmm. if you share a room with somebody, you can knock a little dough off, but you know, it's, I think when you consider what you, I mean, you're getting seven solid days of basically, of first of all, eating all the food you can possibly eat. Yeah, uh, there was and, a lot of that. <laughs> oh yeah, and then and then just entertainment and fun all day long, and then uh, our um, package includes a lot of the stuff that normally gets tacked on at the end, and you're surprised. Like at the end of a cruise, normally you get this big bill for gratuities for the week. Mm -hmm. we, we already include that, or port charge. Oh, we that's good. That. So they, all yeah. that stuff is in there. So literally, you, once you sign up, you don't pay another cent. You walk off that thing, not another cent. Awesome. Well, that's yeah. really good. I'm excited. I can't wait. What are the dates for the cruise again? October 15th through the 22nd of 2017. ContraCruise.com is the website for that. And then in general, for me, uh, Tom'sFreeBooks.com is where I have I have some libertarian ebooks that I I uh, put together, basically to help people win debates, like to give you really good ammunition. And you can just oh, nice. download them. Check that out. Yeah, it's just Tom's. Do you have them in audiobooks or just readable books? I don't have them in audiobooks, but on the other hand, I do have the 900 podcast episodes, so you can always. Oh, you and your on. 900 podcast is just yeah. not enough, Tom. You no, need I, more. Wait, let's, no, you know what? It, I'm, it's, you've created a monster because now when I get to 1,000, you're never going to hear the end of it. You're never. <laughs> it's just going to be 1,000 episodes. Well, it's it's going to be. I'm not going to be able to stand myself when it gets to that point. Well, I'm I'm glad that you're doing them. I, I've learned a lot th from them over the years, and it's nice to send my mom and dad stuff. Uh, although they're they're pretty libertarian themselves, I, I was lucky that they didn't indoctrinate me with any kind of left or right. They were both just like government thumbs down. <laughs> nice, nice, good for yeah. you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for coming on the show. Um, I look forward to the Contra Krugman cruise, and uh, you know the thousandth episode. Um, and of course, everybody, check out libertyclassroom.com. I think it's really cool. They've got a new app. Uh, any final words, Tom? Uh, nothing other than thank you for, for being Tatiana Moroz and, and coming on, on our cruise uh, the second year in a row. And it's been, it's, it's been a lot of fun together, hasn't it? Uh, oh, yeah. Every, every time our paths cross, it's always for something awesome and great and exciting and thrilling. And I hope that never ends. Yeah, there are some, you know, there are some low points when you're fighting for freedom, but there are a whole lot of high points where you make a lot of good friendships and and, and, and by the way, can I just say as, purpose. As, yeah. as one parting thing that even if our events were nothing other than preaching to the choir, you know, we we do from time to time need to have our, uh, you know, our our um, optimism and, and our our camaraderie strengthened. You know, absolutely, that, that's very important. That's not a small thing. I agree. Yeah, we got to fight the power and we've got to feel like family. So, um, right, right. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for watching the show. Thank you to cryptocompare.com and to bitcoincpa.com and all of our other sponsors. Um, uh, especially go check out freeross.org, my site, tatianamrose.com, where you can buy the brand new re record, Keep the Faith, and uh, cryptomediahub.com if you want to learn more about Bitcoin stuff. Thanks again, Tom, and we'll see you all next week. Peace out.